Oh, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me well? Good. Okay, good. It's my, it's my pleasure being here this morning, and I'm so, so grateful for an opportunity to come and, and visit you here at Caribou Community Church. Um, I feel like this visit is, is long overdue, and I apologize for that. It's just Williams Lake is so far away. It takes a while, it takes a while to get here. Um, but as a, as a church, like Paul said, Pastor Paul said, you've been, you've been supporting me and this campus ministry work, I think you probably didn't even know that, but when, when money goes to classes, to our denomination, uh, some of it gets directed into all the different ministries we do. So I'm very much a, a missionary of this church, of this congregation, and I, th I thank you for it. It's a great, it's a great responsibility and a, and a joyful challenge for me to be able to work among the students and the staff and the faculty at the University of British Columbia's campus. I'm just going to pull up a slide here. Yeah, that's the one I want. That's it. Perfect. I worked for a number of years as a missionary with my family in Central Africa. And when I came back to Canada and I started working at the university, I, I sometimes would, would kind of make a joke like I would say, oh, I'm, I'm a missionary to this strange, exotic, and slightly dangerous place. And then I'd pause and people would think I was going to say, you know, the, the Amazon jungle or something. And then I'd say, I would say, the university campus, this strange, exotic, and slightly dangerous place that is the public secular university. It's a mission field, and I want you to think of it like that. It's a place where Jesus Christ is Lord, but his reign is not recognized. And so what campus pastors do is try to encourage students who are believers or are struggling with faith to walk closer to Jesus. We try to make Jesus Christ beautiful to people who don't believe in him, faculty and, and students, and we try to witness to his truth and, rec and, and help people recognize that the story that's told in the Bible, the story that Jesus gives us, is a life-giving story. It's true and it's good and it makes us flourish. There's lots of opposition on campus, lots of challenges for sure, but I'm sustained by prayers of people and by the Holy Spirit who, who walks with me and, and guides me into conversations. UBC Okanagan, if you've driven past it or visited it, um, it's changing every year. I've been on this campus for seven years, and as you can see from that very bottom stat, from, 20, from 2005 to 2020, there's a 350% increase in the actual size of the campus. Like, it's mind-boggling. Every year, a new building goes up. Every year enrollment is higher and there's over 11,000 students with about a quarter of them coming from out of country, which is an amazing group to work with. Students from Asia, East Asia, from India, from Africa, from Latin America. And uh, th there's even a big downtown campus being, being planned. Um, it's, a, it's a marvelous place to work at and so many opportunities for witnessing to Jesus Christ. A, lo a lot of my work is with is, is worth um, students one-on-one, -on -one, just having conversations about their life, where they are in, 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 the, in walking with Jesus Christ, struggles they might have. Uh, I also spend a fair amount of time working with faculty. So these are the professors. And uh, it's really important, it's a really important group because in the university, ideas matter. And the, one, the, the people who are, who are creating the ideas and promoting them are professors. And ideas have a big influence in shaping our world. So we want to be able to encourage Christian faculty particularly to articulate their ideas well and in a gospel way so that those ideas have traction uh, in the classroom or in the world at large. Um, I'm happy to take any questions after, after the sermon on, on what I do. Uh, more specifics. I've also got a couple of my latest reports, like my latest uh, updates, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more of what this looks like. But I'd encourage you, just as I'm speaking and preaching, if there's a, if there's a question kind of percolating in your mind, a specific question about what campus ministry might look like, um, ask me afterwards, and I'm happy to talk about it. 
It's a really exciting ministry, and I'm proud of our church, our church denomination, for doing this. Most church denominations don't do this. In fact, I often hear when I'm out and about in Kelowna and I bump into people from other churches and they, they'll say, oh, you I'll say, I work at the university as, as a chaplain, as a campus pastor, and they'll be like, oh, that's, what a, what a, what a godless place. And, and I say, exactly, that's where we want to be though, right? We want to, we want to be the presence of Christ in a place that's often not manifesting God's rule and reign. And, and I'm proud of our church denomination. We have about 40 across North America um, campus pastors who are, who are really working in this very strategic mission field. So your prayers are always valued by me. So please do keep me in prayer and uh, think of me, pray for me. And if you ever have any questions for me, um, just shoot questions at me. You'll, my contacts will be up. My contacts are, no. No, I didn't bring my code. All right. I will leave my, my update, which has my contacts. But, and Pastor Paul always knows how to contact me. So again, as my final word as campus pastor visiting, just thank you again to Caribou Community Church for your support over the years. Um, you are part of something that God is doing among young people, among professors, and among staff in a very strategic and important mission field that's right here in Canada. You know, we don't need to send missionaries to other countries. Um, well, we do, but we don't just need to think of missionaries as, as being people who are sent out of country. We've got mission fields right here close to home, including Williams Lake as a mission field too. But this is a very special one. University campuses are, are a special mission field. And we're part of something good as a church when we support campus pastors like me. So thank you very much and God bless you. I'm going to bring us into God's word now. I'm going to read Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29, and then speak for about 20 minutes on a topic I think is very relevant to the university and college campus, which is unbelief, struggling with doubt, and the importance of faith. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. Hear what God has to say to Caribou Community Church this morning. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. 
Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the proclamation of his word. So this story from Mark's gospel, it drops us smack dab into the middle of conflict. The story begins, there's this, there's really this thick tension in the air. It hangs over everything. Jesus has been away. It's kind of like he's off stage. And in this story, he comes back into the stage, comes back into scene. And Mark has us following him into the scene of tension and of turmoil. Jesus' followers are arguing with the scribes and the whole crowd with them. It's a very, it's a very uncomfortable place to be in. Maybe you felt that when I read this story. It's all this arguing and tension. It's uncomfortable, but don't walk out of it in your mind, okay? Stay with me, because something very important is happening. I'm just moving my slides here. That's it, that's the one I want, thank you. What are you arguing with them about? Teacher, I brought you my son, says the father. He's possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Ah, so there's tension in the air, harsh words flying back and forth because of a problem, indeed because of a failure. Now Jesus' disciples had been, had been on a roll. They were out and about, proclaiming the kingdom, healing in Jesus' name, driving out demons that keep people down in despair and death. There were crowds, there was success, there was momentum, they were on a roll, but now they fail. This poor father had brought his beloved son to the disciples to be healed of the torments of a demon that had troubled this child his whole life long. And he says, I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. So Jesus' followers had failed. His disciples had failed, and they were understandably disappointed. Now, we, we all know from our own lives that often when we fail, when we stumble, it creates disappointment, right? And disappointment often lays the seeds of doubt. And doubt always grows like a weed. And doubt grows like a weed through this story. The, the disciples are arguing with the crowd because they're embarrassed. It's like they've, they've fallen on their face and collapsed, and everybody's seen it. And that the crowds doubt Jesus, so much so that Jesus himself kind of groans, oh, how much, how long do I have to put up with you guys? And the, f the boy's father, so full of disappointment, he can't get past his doubt either. He says to Jesus, if you can do this, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Doubt is growing like a weed through this story. And then even when Jesus drives out the demon, the crowd still doubts that the child is alive. I don't know if you caught that in the story. Even after Jesus has healed the child, the crowd still doubts that he's alive. They say, most of them said, he looks like he's dead, like he's a corpse. Disappointment and doubt pervade this story. They've seeped through it. It's not a comfortable story to be in, again, don't walk out on it, though. Something very important in this story. In fact, I think, I think if we're honest with ourselves, some of us realize that this is the kind of story that we don't look at from above, from outside. This is the kind of story that we feel ourselves in, like we're part of it. Because, well, like I said, Jesus' disciples, they'd been on a roll. They were flying high. And then at some point, things got hard. There was a challenge, and they failed, and doubt crept in. And that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? 
Have you experienced that dynamic? I have. Challenge, failure, disappointment, doubt. <laughs> Following Jesus, which begins officially for each and every one of us at the point of our baptism, can go easy for a while. It really can. You know, onward and upward, success. But at some point it gets hard and we trip and we fail. And we get disappointed with ourselves, maybe disappointed with God, and doubt creeps in. We blow it. Maybe, maybe even everyone sees our failure, our trip, like Jesus' disciples. Am I cut out for this? What if it happens again? Following Jesus can be hard. Can we do it? Now, I work with a demographic, like a group of people, aged 18 to 25. We call them emerging adults. A couple generations ago, when you were 18, 19, you were kind of an adult, right? Not anymore. Now you're an emerging adult. You're not quite there yet. And if you are this age or you know people this age, it's kind of true. Emerging adults, 18 to 25. It's a group where this dynamic, where this movement of, of, of challenge, failure, disappointment, and doubt is, is kind of rampant. Now, of course, everyone is different, and we all experience differently that moment in life where we realize that following Jesus isn't always a walk in the park, can be a wandering in the wilderness. But all our differences aside, generally, this age group, young adults, emerging adults, is a time when people leave home, they go to college or university or trade school, and this realization kind of hits hard, right in the stomach. This realization that life is hard and that following Jesus can be difficult too. Probably the number one, number two question I get from first and second year university students. Todd, I feel, like, I feel like I'm struggling in my faith. I didn't realize it was so hard following Jesus on campus. Really, number, question number one or two. I get it all the time. Not just from first year students, but also from fourth year students and graduate students. It's harder than I thought to follow Jesus on, as, as a student. What can I do? Can you help me? Maybe if you went off to university, you had a similar experience. Or maybe if, you've, if you just left home to work um, in a trade or you got a job somewhere and you left, this, this disruption of leaving home, of leaving the shelter of mom and dad and the security of family, it can be jarring. It brings all these questions forth. We have to really figure out for ourselves how we can function as adults or emerging adults, as it were. It's not an easy time of life. And most of us will have these challenges and all of us will probably fail at some point, right? You know what I mean. We trip up and we fail and, and we get disappointed. We get disappointed with ourselves and disappointed with God. And then this doubt creeps in, just like this father of the poor child. If you can help me, Jesus, he says. We can't contain our doubts. They creep out and they come out and overwhelm us at times. We can't contain our doubts sometimes. I think it's important to name it, our doubts. We sometimes struggle with doubt, right? Some of you are probably thinking right now, what, me? Never. I'm an, I'm an amazing Christian. I don't believe you. I really don't. I've been a Christian for too long. I've been a pastor for too long. We all have doubts. I think it's okay to name it. Sometimes some of us doubt that there's a God. Sometimes some of us doubt that the Bible is really his word. Sometimes some of us doubt that we're really saved. That's a sad doubt to have. Some of us doubt that God can really make something good of our lives, right? Some people doubt because their minds, 
are critical. I met with a, a, a graduate student in engineering a couple years ago, and she told me she grew up in church and went to Sunday school. But then as she got into university, she said her doubts just overwhelmed her. These were scientific doubts about the Christian faith. And she said with a kind of laugh, she said, I guess I'm, I'm kind of like Thomas in the Bible. You remember Thomas? Some of, you, some of you know the story, some of you don't, but when Jesus was raised from the dead um, in the New Testament, the Apostle Thomas wasn't there the first time that Jesus appeared to his friends. And so when they told him, Thomas, Jesus is raised from the dead, he's alive, he said, I, I don't believe it, I doubt. So we call him Doubting Thomas, right? He says, I need to see this for myself. Other people doubt because life's circumstances just crush them. I know a professor who, who lost her faith through this perfect storm of personal failure, marital failure, and the death of a, of a, beloved, of a beloved family member. And she just felt crushed. And she couldn't go to church anymore. And when I met her, she said, quite frankly, oh, I'm not a Christian anymore. I know a lot of good Christians who struggle with doubt. Maybe we don't doubt that there's a God, but does he really have the whole world in his hands? Is he really there for us? And it can feel that our world is out of control sometimes, right? Whether we're going through the pandemic or the wars that are taking place. So we're not doubting God's existence, we're doubting his promises maybe. I know for a fact as a pastor that on any given Sunday, in any congregation, there are good folks here with a deep, strong faith. And we say hallelujah to that. But there are also people here this morning among us who are just hanging on by their fingernails. Most of us are probably somewhere in between. So what do we do with these doubts when they come up and challenge us? What do we do with them? Well, good Christians, we hide them, right? So that no one sees? No, we don't do that. What I love in this story is how Jesus brings the doubt right out into the open. He names it. If I can help you, said Jesus. Everything is possible for the one who believes. And then the man gives a wonderful answer. One of, really one of the best sentences in the Bible, I think. He says, I believe, he says. Then I, I always imagine him whispering, Jesus, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Those two things are together in his response. Such a genuine, faithful response. You've said that in your heart, haven't you? I know I have. God, I believe. Help me to believe, because it's hard. Jesus brings this doubt right out into the open. We don't want to hide our doubts like they're dirty secrets, right? As if God can't see it. He can. Bring it out into the open. Let God's grace encounter it. Confront it and heal it. This is good for us to do rather than to pretend we're some kind of super Christian who never struggles, never doubts, never fails. Having faith in Jesus doesn't mean we never have questions or doubts or struggles. It means we follow Christ despite those doubts and struggles. It's taking the leap of faith, like this father did in the story, where he says, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. We want to be like the father in this story. We don't want to be like the crowds. In this story, the crowds are kind of the foil, like the, the alternative showing us what we shouldn't be like. This, the, the crowds see Jesus exercise a demon. Can you bring up the net? Yeah, thanks. Exercise a demon. 
they see, they see Jesus give this child life and they still only see death. It's a remarkable thing. Jesus gives life to this child and they still only see death. And only then does Jesus lift this child up, making very, very clear that he's alive. Sometimes in life, everything we look at will look like death. Everything we look at is shadow. And it's through faith, through faith, that we see otherwise, that we see life and light. Christians can look at this scene of a dead man hanging on a cross, along with everyone else, and they're only going to see someone, someone dead on a cross. They're going to see someone's defeat. But what do we see? Through faith, we see the victory of God. Don't we? We see Jesus' victory over death and despair and the devil. We know this by faith, that this is a scene not of death, but of hope and victory. One of the things we do when we come to church regularly is we're actually training our minds and our hearts to be able to look at all the despair and death and defeat in the world and through faith still know that God is at work bringing hope and healing and victory. It's not easy to do, is it? Because this world can look very dark, but we have the gift of faith and it opens our eyes. One of my favorite lines, I've had this written on my whiteboard at home and above my desk at times is this sentence, if you could bring up the next slide, from, a, from an older missionary to India, um, Leslie Newbegin. He says, faith is the courage to confidently believe that which can be doubted. I think it's a great line. Faith is the courage to confidently believe that which can be doubted. We believe in something that can be doubted which means we act with courage to commit ourselves every day to following Jesus Christ, every day to believing God's promises, to overcoming our doubts. Faith does not deny doubt. It overcomes it, sometimes daily, by the grace of God. Something really important, I think, follows from this, something very practical. We want to, when we're struggling with doubt, when we're, when we're wrestling with doubt, we want to bring our doubts out into the open. And we want to do this before God, and we want to do this while we're still part of God's people, while we're part of the church. This means that a church, a congregation, has to be a place where there's space and room for people to doubt and have hard questions, right? Think, think of, this, of this, this grad student that I was telling you about, the one in engineering who, who lost her faith. And she said, I'm like doubting Thomas, right? And she said that with a smile. When I was talking to her, I, I actually, she didn't like this answer, but this is what I did. Um, I kind of poked at her a little bit and I said, oh, you're, you're, like, you're like Thomas. Um, so, you, you know, you went to Sunday school. What, what happened in this story? And she could remember the story and she said, well, Thomas, uh, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus was raised from the dead. And uh, a week later, um, Jesus appeared again. And then he showed himself to Thomas and Thomas believed. And I said, so, so, so slow down for a minute. Thomas, Thomas met with the, these early Christians and he didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And, and where was he a week later? And she said, well, he was with the other Christians. I said, oh, so Thomas doesn't believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. He has doubts. But a week later, he's still at church. And she kind of saw where I was going, right? Thomas doesn't believe. He doubts that Jesus is raised from the dead. And yet a week later, where do we find Thomas? In church. He's with the other believers. So I said to her, you're not actually like Thomas because Thomas brought his doubts with him to church. He brought his doubts with him to God's people, and there they were healed. Like I said, she didn't really like my answer, but no. Sometimes I need to poke a little bit, right? When people are, are flippant and, uh, and cheeky that way. I don't think she's brought her doubts to church yet, but I hope and pray that someday she will. 
as a, as a skeptic, that she'll bring those doubts with her into God's people and that whatever church she ends up in, there'll be room for her there. We want to bring our doubts with us before God into the open. And we do this not apart from God's people, the church, but as part of them. And that means as a church, we always need to make space for those people who are struggling, who have some hard questions, who are really wrestling, who are in a, in a tough spot. And hold them in prayer, and listen to them, and love them, and believe and hope that in time, God will address their doubts and bring them back to full faith, overcome their struggle to believe. I told you about this professor who had lost her faith because of all the adverse circumstances and difficulties in her life, right? I met with this professor fairly regularly uh, for conversation. We go out for a coffee or we go out for a beer and we talk about life and we talk about philosophy and we talk about God. And she, she, she was very clear that she's not a Christian. And then a couple years ago, um, when I dropped in to see her, she just, she just blurted out, oh, uh, last week I went to church. And I said, oh, you went to church. She said, I'm, I'm still not a Christian, but I, I went back to church. I just felt like I, I needed to go to a place to pray. And she said, I, I, I'm not able to say the creed, though, like our, our statement of beliefs. And, and I thought to myself, well, let's give it some time. Fast forward a couple years later, and that person is part of the worship team at their church. Right? Her faith is scarred, but she's whole. She was able to be part of a community that could accept her with all her struggles and be patient with her as the Holy Spirit gently but firmly brought her back to full faith. And I thank God for that. People who doubt and who are struggling, some of you, we want you part of this church. We want you part of our communities. You may not be able to believe everything you sing, but you're still going to be singing with us. You're going to be hearing God's word spoken. You're going to see the body and the blood of Christ broken before you in the Lord's Supper. You'll encounter Jesus. You know, a, a recent report on Gen Z. You know what I mean by Gen Z? Yeah, the younger generation says that, um, let me find that. One of, the, one of the main reasons that they leave church as emerging adults is because they feel like their churches aren't places they can bring their doubts and questions to. It's sad. We want to be the kind of body, the kind of people that anybody, not just Gen Z, but anybody can bring their doubts and their struggles to and find love and a place here. And in time, have those doubts overcome by the grace of God, right? We want to be like that kind of, of people who, who have space for that, this gracious space. We want to be the kind of community where people can suffer disappointments and failures and can say, God, I believe. Jesus, help my unbelief. Those two things which belong together. Some people here are able to say amen to a prayer in a loud, strong voice. Other people on a given Sunday are going to just be able to whisper that amen. One thing that I've, I've been really helped by over the years um, in, our, in our Christian Reformed tradition, we have a, an old statement of faith called the Heidelberg Catechism, written way back in, this, in the 1500s. And it's a kind of question and answer that helps us grow in our, in our knowledge of faith and be, and be confirmed in it. And it ends with this question, which is an odd one, and I'll pose it to you. What does, all mean, what does the word amen mean? Which we tack on the end of every prayer, right? What is, yeah, so it is, or so be it, right? Sometimes when we say our prayers, you know, amen, and we mean it. But you've also had times in your life, though, when you're praying and you're just, amen, and, you're, and your voice is wavering because your faith is weak, right? 
And the Heidelberg Catechisms asks this question, what does all men mean? And it answers it like this. This is, this is a perfect, this is pitched perfectly for people who are struggling. Maybe that's you this morning. All men means this shall truly and surely be. And this is what I love this, this sentence here. It is even more sure that God listens to my prayer than that I really desire what I pray for. You've said prayers like that before, right? Just a shot in the dark, a cry of hope. God, if you're there, hear me. Amen. The God of covenant love hears you. And it's even more sure that he's listening to you than that we really believe what we're praying for. Isn't that a marvelous thought? This is the God of covenant love whose mercies are ever new. When it feels like the foundations of our world are rattled and our lives are struggling, following Christ in those circumstances can be hard, can be difficult, and it's easy for doubt and uncertainty to creep in. Let it. Bring them to church with you. Bring them to God. Lay them before the cross and confess, sometimes daily for some of us, if you're in one of those seasons, Confess, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. Doubt isn't the opposite of faith. It's a challenge that makes us daily choose to follow Christ with joy and confess him with confidence. Amen. And when I say amen, I mean it. Knowing that God means it even more. God, add your blessing to the reading and the proclamation of your word. For those of us whose faith is weak and who struggle, whether they're college-aged, university-aged, retirees, or shortly before death, God, comfort them with your peace. Overcome their doubts by your faith and help us as a community, as a church denomination, to show the same kind of grace and hospitality that you yourself showed in dealing with the man in this story from this morning. We ask this in his name, amen. Q and A? Yeah. Just before we, uh, we have some songs, um, Pastor Paul asked me if I'd be willing to take any questions. Always a risky endeavor, but I'm happy to do it. Um, maybe you have some questions about what university ministry looks like. Maybe you have a question on my sermon, but I think maybe more just who am I and why am I here? Those, I'm sure you're kind of wondering um, what campus ministry looks like or you have specific questions about the nature of faith. Um, I know you're a, an engaged congregation and uh, oh, over the past couple of years, I've had two, two students I know have come from this church down to UBC Okanagan, Marley and Johnny Russell. Those names, um, ring a bell, right? Yeah, and um, they've always spoken very, very highly and warmly of their faith community here, which is wonderful. Um, these, were, these were students that I felt grew up in a church where people could have questions and doubts, where people didn't feel like they had to be perfect. That was always very clear talking to these young people from Caribou Community Church. So, you know, good on you for being the kind of church that, that can welcome people who fail and who are struggling. Uh, any questions from you to me about campus ministry work? Anything that, that's, that's made you curious? Yeah. That's great Holy, Holy Spirit timing, I think. I know. Yeah? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to, because I don't know what to say about that, because um, I think we, like we said, we all have the same 
think what's more, what's hard is uh, is having it when you see the miracles of God every day, like in our lives, in the past, how we've moved and done things, but yet you still struggle today when things are, if you brought these things before his throne again and again, but yet feel like God is not listening or he's not, why don't you answer, Lord? You know? Um, but it's just a great comfort to me that you speak about this today and yesterday we talked about it. You know, and that was exactly what we're talking about. That's what I came with was doubt, right? Why do I do? But I just feel a great comfort because it's a reassurance of God listening. Yeah. That I'm not alone. I'm not feeling of doubt or or like Thomas or whatever or that. I feel, you know, I don't know what. It's just an increasing of my faith to believe that God heard or that he's here even though that those things are there. You're not alone, and God hears you. And by his grace, may, his, may your doubts be assaged. May they be addressed in time. Yeah. You know, in Hebrews, faith is defined for us as belief in something we can't see. And that's hard. If we had constant miracles before our eyes all the time, and wonders, you know, every time we turned around, faith would be easy, but it seems like God has designed faith to kind of, to kind of challenge us, to challenge us to go after it. And one great Christian theologian, Martin Luther, who's, who started the Protestant Reformation, talked about faith as, in, in, a very, in a very catchy way, I thought, and I, literally, he said, faith is seizing hold of God with both hands. And there's this kind of, kind of sense of, you know, you just have to grab onto him sometimes and hold on tight because it's hard. That's sort of what he meant. And you're in a stage in life, maybe a moment in life where you need to grab onto God with both hands and that's tough, but you're hanging in by the Holy Spirit's power. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I have a question. Yeah. Do you actually have a location where you can gather with people on campus? That's a, that's a, a really good question. If you'd asked me that question like 18 months ago, I'd say no, but now I can say yes, actually. And it took, this is a, a good example of the, of the nature of the secular university right now, but it, it took about four or five years of advocacy um, with me working alongside of, of Muslim groups on campus, actually, to, to get the university to commit a, an actual space for us, which we call the spirituality and multi-faith space. And it's a room that, that all different religious groups are allowed to use, and we've got a booking system in place, um, which is wonderful. Br prior to that, we, we had to find classrooms, and it was often a little precarious if we, if we could even find space to meet. Um, so things have improved. Um, it's, it's always a challenge, but in this case, uh, this challenge has been overcome by God's grace. So. I'm still waiting to have an office. Don't have that yet, but. Uh, yeah, Bert, and then Paul. Yeah, um, when I was in my early 20s, I attended the campus uh, service at the University of Toronto. Certain more security hours, yeah, after that, I asked a few questions of me. And then later, I was at John Meester. say I had double the faith that was part of my life issues at the time. And uh, anyways, just to give it people a bit more background as to people's experience and that kind of thing. Got, stole my question really. <laughs> uh, we met at the University of Toronto in a place called Hard Lives and my brother uh, went to the University of Waterloo and he attended services there. Thanks for thanks for the testimony of, of campus ministry. Yeah, I do I do uh, I do most of my pastoral care and counseling on campus at the campus Starbucks, um, or on a bad day the Tim Hortons on campus. No, I, I like Tim Hortons too. Uh, I'm just kidding. You're gonna have to leave. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Which is which is actually. 
I often think, you know, Jesus, Jesus did some of his work in the temple and some of his work in the synagogue, but a lot of the time, like Pastor Paul, he's out and about on the streets, right? And campus ministry is like that too. Where, where are people hanging out? They're in the cafeteria. So I kind of hang out there too. Yeah. Paul, you had some questions. Yeah, um, I have three questions, but I'll cut it to two. Um, one thing that I appreciate in your report the last time we talked about uh, bringing a region professor to address the issue of artificial intelligence and what the theological uh, relationship that with that, the embodiment of what God does with creation. So I would like you to address that. And secondly, um, maybe as you do your ministry, maybe there's a dream that you have of a project that you really want, but maybe there's no finances, so you will say, then this would be nice if I have it. Uh, maybe you can share it. So those are the two good, questions. Good questions. So Paul's first question, Paul, Paul was at Classus um, two weeks ago. So I gave, my, I gave a, a, a short report. And we brought up a professor of Old Testament, of, 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 of scripture, to speak on campus. And then he gave a small conference in Kelowna. And he spoke to about 65 students. And this is a good, Paul's question is a good reminder of, of why ideas matter. So he spoke about artificial intelligence. You all know what I, what I mean when I, when I say artificial, AI, right? Um, computer intelligence. And what that means for, for us as, as creatures of flesh and blood, creatures made in God's image. Um, all sorts of interesting overlap. Paul's p particular question was about what it means to be embodied. In other words, think of it like this. When God makes us, in the book of Genesis, we're described, he, he's, God's described as taking the dust and he breathes his spirit into it. And that's what humankind comes from. So we are spirit embodied. Um, what that means is that our bodies really matter. They're gifts from God, right? We're not, we're not our person, our sense of self or our personhood isn't something that's floating free of our bodies, either as a soul or as a mind. And where this becomes controversial is in things like AI, where its proponents are arguing for what they would call a transhuman future. So the, the real person is the brain, and at some point we'll be able to take our brains out of our bodies and either give ourselves robotic bodies or no bodies at all. This, this, sounds, this sounds odd and, and maybe a little bit um, you know, Star Trek-ish, but uh, this hits the ground actually in really concrete ways if you just think about what's going on in our schools right now, where actually kids in schools are being taught that their real self isn't their body, right? Their real self is their feelings inside. So the body is almost expendable. We can choose to have any kind of gender we want. This is what everybody in culture is saying right now. This professor's argument is that as Bible-believing Christians, when we take both Genesis seriously and the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead with a body, we can't split our soul or our mind apart from our body. These things always belong together as the gift of God that is the human person. And so the Christian tradition and the Christian church he's arguing needs to be really clear about why it's good news for our kids, good news for our culture, good news for the future, that we are embodied that we are spirits in a body, and that's what it means to be a person, that we don't split these things apart and make our bodies something expendable. Jesus was raised for the redemption of our bodies, not for their removal, right? Yeah. Your other question, Paul, um, if, there's, if there's something that I'd love to do, if I have a dream and I'm looking for money for it, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of yes and and an even bigger yes. So one thing that we've really been hoping to do for the last four or five years is put an associate on the campus of Okanagan College. Okanagan College is also in Kelowna. It's the biggest community college in the BC's interior. It's mostly focused on trades. And uh, through some fundraising just this past year, this past September, Thank God we've been able to, I've been able to hire someone to work um, one day a week at the Okanagan College campus, which is really cool. His name is Curtis, and he's been a youth pastor in, uh, in a, at a Christian Reformed church in Langley for 10 years. Now he's working with me one day a week while he's doing his studies to be a minister. And uh, he's already got a little Bible study going on this 
college campus, which as far as I know is the first time in its history that they've had a little Bible study, which is amazing. Um, so that's something that, that's something that I, I hope will continue. Curtis won't be able to do it forever, probably just for another year, but I'd love to see that continue. So that's a, that's a, a kind of target where I've set for trying to raise funds for that um, so that, it'll, it, that it will continue, that we'll have a real, a real gospel presence, not just at UBC, but also at OC. The second one, this is, this is my, my big dream, um, but I need about a million dollars for it, okay? So, <laughs> I, would, I would love, yeah, I need, Lord help my unbelief. Um, I need a million dollars because real estate is so expensive in Kelowna, but I'd, I'd love to buy a house, a, a house with a number of rooms and have a, a kind of student house in Kelowna. So that when, when people come from Williams Lake or from Alberta and they're Christians and they want to have a Christian community, you know, we've got five or six rooms where people could live together in community and challenge each other, grow together, pray together, um, build each other up in the faith. I'd have a bit of a mentoring role, but really it'd be a, a place for genuine Christian community to form. There's a couple of these across Canada. There's one at, in Queen's University in Ontario. And I know the Pentecostal Church has one in UBC Vancouver, um, these kind of student houses. And uh, what I've heard is that so many future leaders in the church and in the kingdom of God kind of get their start in these houses. So that's, I'd love that, that, for that to happen. But God has to introduce me to a, you know, a really wealthy businessman who's willing to invest in real estate in Kelowna, which is a good investment. Um, but he's not going to, or she's not going to have any returns for a while because, you know, I want that house for 10 years and build up some student leaders. So. Any, any other questions? Yeah, at the back. That's a great, a great question and a, and a really big question. Um, I think I could answer that in so many ways. Yeah, did ever, did the question, if you didn't hear it, was at university, how can I show my faith in everyday ways? Trying to think of a way of answering it that, that doesn't take 20 minutes, because I don't want to give you a second sermon. I've, I've, been, I've had so many conversations this past fall with students asking me about courage. And maybe this is where I'll land in my question. Courage, because it's, it's increasingly difficult to identify as a Christian on campus and to speak up on campus as a believer. It takes real courage. One biblical image I keep coming back to over the past months is, is Daniel. You know, Daniel in the Bible is taken away from his home and because he's smart and talented, like university students are, he gets a position in the Babylonian court. You know, it's an absolutely pagan place. And yet that's where God puts him. And it takes courage for him to act with faithfulness. And what Daniel does is that he prays regularly and he doesn't compromise on his faith. And he doesn't do this in an obnoxious way. You know, he goes and he prays quietly by himself. He lives out his life with integrity. And I think that's a, a great witness for a lot of us on campus. We don't need to be walking around preaching at people or arguing with people. There might be a place for that. But generally, it's just this quiet, persistent witness to what we believe, how we treat others, and how we engage with those around us, you know, in the Babylonian court with our professors. I know some professors who will say terrible things about Christians in their lectures. They'll blame Christianity for every problem in the world from colonialism to economic injustice. And some students want to get up and fight and argue with them in class. And for the most part, that's not the best thing. What I, what I would encourage them to do, for example, is when they're writing their paper um, or writing their test in an essay, you know, give a thoughtful answer. Give a thoughtful answer that's, that's well-informed, that's well-written, that is that kind of plays by the university rules of what we expect a thoughtful argument to look like, and yet is absolutely true to who Jesus Christ is and to, and to the Bible. So I, you know, I could, we could talk about this forever and ever because it's a great question, but just a thought, my first initial thought. 
of, uh, of living Daniel-like in, in Babylon is, is kind of how Christian students and, and Christian faculty really need to live in, uh, in the Babylon that is the university campus. Do we have time for one more question or should I? I have one if you. Yeah, sure. How do you, um, you talk, you, really, really good sermon. You talked about people bringing their doubts to church, but how do we as a church, how do we as a church, like do you have any practical thing, advice to change what we're doing to make it something that is more welcoming and more inspiring to young people? Like what is it about the church, traditional church service that is, um, that I guess mo mo the people, like that generation that you're dealing with finds most uh, difficult or, or, or unwelcoming or uninspiring to be part of? Yeah, um, thanks, thanks Lance. I'm gonna turn my back to you to answer the yeah, question absolutely. though, okay? <laughs> um, I'm not being rude. I kind, of, I kind of hear two different questions there. One is how can we, how can be, we be accommodating or, or make space for people who are struggling with doubt? And then secondly, what, what does a church look like that, um, that, is, that is attractive to younger people um, and, and people, and maybe people who are struggling as well? Is, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you know when, when Jeremy began the this, this service and said, said some of, some of you are coming here today with grief in your hearts and, and, and broken in spirit. Um, that's, that's a wonderful way to just acknowledge in the room that as much as we're here to praise God and lift up our hearts to him in praise, some of us are going to struggle to do that, and that's okay. So I think even, even small things like that can go a long way to making the church a place where people who are in different places in their walk with God can come. So I, I don't know enough about your church to answer your first question well, because I don't know what you're doing otherwise. Just what I've heard this morning was, was very, was very um, apropos. And uh, the fact that you're talking about doubt at a men's breakfast, you know, a lot of churches wouldn't do that. We, we paper over that, you know, we bring a smile on our face to church. We don't talk about those things, but a church that can talk about these, that can air them out, is an honest place, and I think that's where the Holy Spirit is at work. So keep keep that up. Um, your, your, your second question is is really hard. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm new to church. Maybe take maybe take the mic. There we go. Um, I'm, I'm new to church. Uh, my name is Jerry. And um, um, the one thing that um, I found, uh, found hard for me to, like, for, for approaching a church or, or even walking in the door um, or um, listening to a sermon was, um, I didn't understand. I didn't understand the sermons. I didn't understand um, what was being said. I didn't. I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. Um, and then um, over time, I, um, you know, I through going to different churches, you know, I, I found the community church um, down to earth and more uh, um, understanding. Uh, I, I, I could understand the sermons because the sermons were down to earth. They, they met, you know, they met us in the middle where, where you know, I, I could better understand it, the sermons, and I knew it was being said, and, and, um, and, and, and that's what I find that's what I find here. That's what keeps me coming back, right? And I don't know if that speaks to what Lance is saying there, but um, um, hopefully that 
you know. Thank, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that, that definitely spoke to what Lance was asking. And I think a good testament to this church's hospitality and ability to bring, to welcome in people who, who are starting in different places. You know, Bert's, Bert went to campus ministry as a young man at the U of T. He's grown up in the church, and Jerry's just walked in off the street. Uh, and you're both here, and that's wonderful. That's, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, and just quickly to Lance's other question, I, I really can't answer that in, in an easy way. Like students, for, for as much as they're one demographic, as much as emerging adults have things in common, they're also very different. And I know by looking at Kelowna, there are, our students love going to some of the big, you know, kind of mega churches with have flashing lights and smoke and electric guitars. They love that, they eat it up. But there's also lots of students who don't like that and they're really interested in more traditional services. In fact, in the last year, I've had a couple students go to a church, a really small church that has an organ you know, a pipe organ, and they sing hymns because they, they're really drawn to that sense of roots of, of, of a church that's, 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 very, that's very rooted in the Christian faith. Um, so there's not one way of doing it. It's, it's just recognizing your own DNA as a congregation and then recognizing, I think also, or, or praying that God leads you to being the best version of your church you can be. Um, generally, students, recognize and think younger people in, in, in general right now, um, they're, they're, they're grow, they've grown up on social media. They know there's lots of nonsense and lots of, of truths and different stories. They recognize genuineness and they have a hunger for it. And whether that genuineness looks charismatic and flashy or whether it's you know s sober pipe organs and prayer books, it's it can be both genuine, and they resonate with that. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for all the questions. I'm, I'll be around for a few minutes after the service, too, if you want to come and talk to me directly. I'd love to, to hear from you.